Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and it's Friday and 3.35. I want to do a quick video, try to do a short one here, um, on what is justifying faith and how does faith justify a sinner in the sight of God? And that's two questions from the Westminster Larger Catechism. I just wanted to address those because they're so important. And um, I was actually... Uh, for, I don't know why I uh, just finished some stuff and finished my sermon and I've been actually just finished editing the manuscript. I'm, I've got a book I'm working on. I, I need to reread the manuscript one more time uh, on the book of Nehemiah. I have edited all my sermons. Finally got them formatted in a word document. I just need to proofread it one more time, touch it up a little bit. And then it's going to be a new book coming out on the book of Nehemiah, all the sermons that I did on, on Nehemiah. And it's in Word um, with no spacing or anything. It's 91 pages, which will probably translate to a couple hundred uh, when it's published. So anyway, I was thinking about um, G.K. Chesterton and uh, thinking about uh, him because uh, of certain Protestants that like to, uh, well, faux Protestants that like to quote from him and uh, push him. And I was just looking, just did some Googling. Um, what, what did G.K. Chesterton teach about justification? What did he teach about how you get to heaven? Because uh, some, some have tried to tell me, well, the only reason he went into Rome is because the Church of England was such a, a apostate liberal mess and Rome was the next best thing. And I'm like, that's not a good reason uh, to do that. And I have his book, Orthodoxy, on Kindle, and I searched it in every way I could think of. Saved, salvation, justified, just, heaven, hell, looked at all of our... I can't find a, a clear description of what he thought about how you get to heaven. But I, I, an article um, came up as I was Googling around just to see if I could get some clear statements from him on this. Uh, and found an article uh, by in a Roman Catholic periodical. This is from November of 2016. It's called Teaching the Faith from the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars. And uh, just reading through some of this article, it's not, it's not very long. It's only like three pages long. But the last sentence of this just made me think they, they have to misrepresent us because they can't deal directly with what our what the position really is, what scripture really says about this. It, it says, the last line in the article says, the Protestant offers the filthy, stinking man a long, white bathrobe. The Catholic offers him a hot shower. That's how they always caricature us. We just think God clothes the filthy, stinking, rotten sinner with the righteousness of Christ, and that's our view, and you just, you're just you still this rotten, miserable, stinking, unworthy sinner. Now, yes, we're always sinners in the sight of God, but we're also born again by God's Spirit, and our hearts are changed by the power of God, and the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, and our desires radically change. So we have a hot shower too, but that's not justification. Justification before God, being saved from God's wrath, requires us to have this long white bathrobe. In fact, it is one of the images that the Old Testament uses to describe uh, our salvation is a robe of righteousness. In fact, listen to it, Isaiah 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. So, yeah, when you're sinful and you're not perfect in God's sight, it's not such a bad thing to be clothed for the filthy, stinking man to be clothed with a long white bathrobe. But we also take a shower. In that, God begins the cleansing process. He begins that sanctification process where he chips away at the old man. And through our trials and through our use of the means of grace, we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we learn to put sin to death more and more. We learn to walk in God's ways. And we, we learn to have faith in him and to trust him in every situation in life. So what is justifying faith? What does it mean when we talk about justification by faith alone. What is faith? Well, faith is, is not the best translation of the Greek verb, uh, pistuo, believe. We believe in Jesus. What, what does that mean? Be to believe in Jesus means you no longer believe in your works. 
i.e. you're relying on the finished work of Christ and nothing else to get you into heaven. You're not relying on what he's doing in your heart. You're not relying on how much he's cleansing you. You're not relying on the progress you think he's making and making you better. It's relying on his righteousness to get you into heaven. That's what Romans chapter 10 is talking about when Paul speaks about the zeal of the Jewish people. He says, I bear them witness. They have a great zeal for God, but it's not according to righteousness. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What does it mean to submit to the righteousness of God? It means that as you consider that terrifying reality that you will stand before the holy God on the day of judgment and are going to be judged by he who is all-knowing and he who is ineffably holy uh, before whom no one can stand, no one can look upon him and live. What are you trusting in to get you past that judgment? The Christian trusts in, believes in Christ alone, not what Christ is doing in their hearts or anything like that. Justification, being saved and, and rescued from the wrath of God, the avenging wrath of God, means that a person is receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness therein held forth for pardon of sin and for the accepting and accounting of his person as righteous in the sight of God for salvation. We are accepted and accounted as righteous, legally accounted as righteous, just as it says in Genesis 15, 6, one of Paul's favorite verses, Abraham believed in Yahweh and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham didn't work. Abraham uh, didn't do anything. He simply believed, meaning he was relying upon God's promise and therefore he was justified. Now, question 73 of the Westminster Larger Catechism is a very important, uh, very crucial question. How does faith justify a sinner in the sight of God? Great question. How does that work? And what does that mean? I don't believe in my works. I believe in Jesus Christ to save me. I'm trusting in not on myself, not on my works, not on my progress, not in how well I'm doing, not on the change I see in my life. I'm trusting not in my works, but in Christ alone. How does that work? Listen to this answer. It's wonderful. Faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God, not because of those other graces which do always accompany it, or of good works that are the fruits of it. Did you hear that? So the reason that faith justifies us has nothing to do with the other graces that always accompany faith, namely repentance, works, obedience, living the Christian life, putting sin to death, pursuing holiness. Faith doesn't justify us because of those fruits that accompany it, nor of good works that are the fruits of it. The good works that I do as a Christian are my expression of gratitude. Uh, they, they help to give me assurance, not because they saved me, but because they are the fruit of true and lively faith, of their, their fruit that it's real, that it's present there. Okay, uh, Good works adorn our profession of the gospel. They shut the mouths of adversaries, but they don't save us. And they're not part of what faith is. So faith justifies me not because of the other graces that accompany it, like repentance, good works, and perseverance, or of good works that are the fruits of it, not as if the grace of faith or any act thereof were imputed to him for his justification, like the Arminians taught that, well, okay, God doesn't expect you to obey his commandments since that's not possible since the fall, so he'll accept faith in the place of that. That's not what it is either. And then they give the correct answer. But only as it is an instrument by which he receives and applies Christ and his righteousness. Okay, so when I believe in Christ, God imputes Jesus's legal, moral righteousness to my account. His fulfillment of the covenant of works is legally credited to my account. Like Romans 4, 6 says, just as David speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works has nothing to do with my works. Faith isn't works. Faith is not obedience. Faith doesn't even include works. A faith that doesn't include obedience either. Faith is the opposite of working. It's the opposite of, obey, of obedience. Does faith, does, is faith accompanied by works and obedience? Yeah, but it's not what it is. Faith lays hold of and rests solely and only upon Christ and his righteousness. 
and it's an instrument by which we appropriate and lay hold of Jesus Christ's righteousness. So when the person is effectually called, when they are, when they're shown their sin, convinced of their sin and misery by the Holy Spirit working in their hearts, just like Acts chapter two, men and brethren, what shall we do? They recognize how deep their sin was and they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted only in him for their justification before God. So that's how faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God. It's not because of anything that accompanies it. It's not because of good works. It's not because of repentance. It's not because of any of the fruit that accompanies faith in Christ, but only in that faith lays hold of Christ and his righteousness. So to summarize, as the great R.C. Sproul summarized long ago, as our great reformers do, um, when we say justification is by faith alone, what we're really saying is we get into heaven by the righteousness of Christ alone, by the merit of Christ's righteousness alone, and not because of anything that I do. Not for the, the one who's working or running or laboring to be saved. The only people who will be saved are those who stop working to be saved and rest upon the finished work of Christ and rely only upon his righteousness. And that's what I'm relying on to get me into heaven. When I think about death and dying and the day of judgment, my confidence for passing the day of judgment is that Jesus' righteousness will be received by the Father as if it were my very own, and that his cross is accepted as the full payment for all of my sins. That's my only hope. And people immediately raise the question, oh, well, you're just saying that you can live like the devil and still go to heaven. My answer to that question is exactly the same as the Apostle Paul's. Romans 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? In other words, it's impossible. It's impossible for someone who truly has faith in Christ, has true faith in the true Jesus and is trusting only in Christ to save them. It is impossible that they will live in sin. But we're not saved by not living in sin. Okay, the fruit that grows on the tree does not make the tree good or bad. It only makes it known to other men whether the tree is a good tree or a bad tree. And works do not make us good or bad. They are only proof of our justification. They are evidence of our justification. So I hope that's helpful. Love y'all. Have a good weekend. Go to church this Lord's Day. Worship God with all of your heart. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, repent and rest upon his finished work alone to save you. Stop trusting in your works. Your works cannot help you get to heaven. Rest upon the finished work of Christ and put on that robe of righteousness. Thanks for watching or listening.